The words that you just sang were taken from our epistle lesson, and they also tell the story of the gospel lesson that we're about to read. But they also tell the way we're feeling about you right now. Without seeing you, we love you, Epworth Church and friends. Without touching you, we embrace. We were talking this morning about how hard it is not to hug one another. When we get back and we have to observe safe distancing, we still won't be able to hug each other. But we follow Christ without seeing, and he says to the disciples in the story we're about to read, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Because the second Sunday of Easter, we always read the same lesson, the story of Thomas, not doubting Thomas, but Thomas who proclaims that he has seen the Lord. And we read now from the 20th chapter of John, beginning at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The season of Easter, the great 50 days of Easter, call for a lot of decorations in homes as well as in the sanctuary. Last week we had tulip bulbs, we had butterflies. Often there are painted eggs. Some of you are probably tired of egg salad by this time. They're all reminders of new life emerging from death. Because if you think about it, they're all images of an empty tomb. The bulb of a tulip or a lily looks kind of like an onion. And it's planted in the fall and it goes into the earth, into the cold earth for the whole of winter where, in effect, it dies before that beautiful flower emerges. The same thing happens with a butterfly. It starts out life not so pretty as a caterpillar. It spins its chrysalis and it stays there until it finally emerges in the springtime as a beautiful butterfly looking not much like it did when it went into the cocoon. The same thing happens with eggs, either those laid by hens or those with plastic eggs, a little marshmallow sugar-covered peep comes out of. What starts out as one thing ends up as another, all symbols of the empty tomb, life emerging from death. Now, I have not been able to sell this in 35 years of ministry, but I would like to introduce a new symbol of the resurrection, and I call it the Easter oyster. Do we have a picture of an oyster to show? There it is. Isn't he pretty? I stand in awe of the first human ancestor to eat an oyster. They're not pretty. Their shells are rough and hard. They're full of sand and grit. They're about as Easter-like as a tulip bulb dying in the earth or perhaps an empty eggshell or a cocoon. Maybe one of our cave-dwelling ancestors watched a seagull scoop one up out of the brine and take it up into the air and drop it on a rock and open it and then stand and eat. Or maybe they saw an otter enjoying its prey. But something compelled this ancient ancestor of ours to crack one of these things open and look at it and eat it. I cannot understand that. I am not an oyster eater. As ugly as they are on the outside, inside they are not much better. And let's be honest, they look kind of like snot. But people love them. And here we are this morning looking at an Easter. And what is an Easter oyster, but a symbol of resurrection, because inside the oyster, 
every now and then you find a pearl. Pearls are formed by an irritant, usually some kind of parasite, that gets inside the shell of the oyster. And nacre is the substance that lines its shell. And over a period of sometimes as many as three years, it will coat the irritant again and again and again until the pearl forms. And I really think this is a good symbol of Easter because it's born of pain. Jesus goes into the room with his disciples. He shows up, the doors are locked, they're scared to death, they're closed up tighter than an oyster shell. And yet he is in their midst. And he shows them willingly his scars, signs of his humanity that he still bears in his resurrected life. He shows them his scars and he breathes not onto them, into them. Think about how John's gospel begins. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, which takes us back to in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. God takes the dust of the earth and breathes life into it. Jesus is doing the same thing with the Holy Spirit, breathing new life into the church that he is forming in his name, into his disciples, although they are locked away in fear. Thomas is not with them. Now, we could say that Thomas was the brave one who was out into the world. Maybe he was the one who was the one with a short straw who had to go out and find food for them. Maybe he was out trying to hear what was happening if they were being hunted down because they had followed their Messiah. But he goes into the room and they say, we've seen the Lord, the same message that Mary had said just in the same chapter of John's Gospel when she tells the disciples that she has seen the Lord, but they do not believe her. And so they are continuously locked away until he comes and stands in their midst. Now he comes back again after Thomas says, until I see him for myself, until I touch those wounds, I will not believe. And Jesus returns. Again, the room is locked, but he just gets in there anyway. And he shows Thomas. And Thomas, unlike the other disciples, falls before him and praises him and proclaims him my Lord and my God. So here we are these years later, feeling a need to lock ourselves away, being told by the governor that we're supposed to keep ourselves locked away. Not forever, but in this time of pandemic, to keep us safe, to prevent this virus from spreading. But the good news in this story is that wherever we are, however isolated we may feel, however closed off we might be, Christ comes to us. He comes to us. It doesn't matter that the doors are locked. It doesn't matter that the walls are thick. He comes to us because he is no longer bound by time and space because he is the Lord who has been resurrected. But he still bears the scars of his human body. He still is willing to show us his scars. I've always said that knocking on someone's door and saying, are you saved, is not a way to share your faith in Jesus Christ. But showing your scars can be. I've often said, and I've said it here, that some of the best churches I've ever visited have been AA meetings, where people go and confess their brokenness, and in that confession find healing and grace and peace. I was amazed a few years ago when one of my parishioners stood up in church. She was a relatively new member of the church, but she stood up and proudly announced that she had received her 40-year chip from Alcoholics Anonymous, 40 years without taking a drink. No one knew that she had a drinking problem. No one knew that she attended AA meetings regularly, and she could have kept that hidden. But instead, she came into the church and stood up and said, I give thanks to my God for delivering me from alcohol. 40 years sober. You know what that did? It inspired other people who are still struggling to seek her out and to find out where she had got this healing, where she had received her peace and her grace. Because a scar is not a sign of woundedness. It is a sign of healing, of old wounds covered by grace. So what does that mean for us today? I think it's time for us to come out of our shells, people. It's time for us to open up to the grace of God in Jesus Christ because that is what transforms us. That is what makes us new. That is what breathes life into us from the Holy Spirit so that we might emerge a new creation. Maybe you're not going to look as pretty as a butterfly. Maybe you're still going to be an oyster because I know my hair has not done very well during these weeks of confinement. But God will bring something beautiful out of our pain 
and our suffering. God who comes to us wherever we are, no matter how far we think we've hidden from the Lord, Christ comes to us with new life, with hope, and with healing. Jesus didn't condemn Thomas. And Jesus must have remembered when everyone else looked at him as the doubter, that he was the one who just before they went back to Jerusalem said, let us go and die with him. He is the one who said to Jesus, how do we know the way? So that Jesus could say, I am the way and the truth and the life. Thomas is not the doubter, but the one who when Christ comes to him, falls on his knees and proclaims him my Lord and my God. May the same be said of each of us as we continue in this time of isolation that Christ has come to us, has breathed new life into us, and through him we have been made whole, we have been made beautiful, we have been healed. We may still bear the scars, but the scars are signs of Christ's new life in us. To the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.